Well, I've had the great fortune of directing Coriolanus here as well as Othello. And, um, you know, when I was working on those pieces, um, I remember people's response was a little bit out of sync with how I thought about it because they were saying, God, you've, you've, you know, done just radical things. And I don't think I have at all. I'm, I'm, when I approach these plays, all I'm trying to do is to vivify what's there. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take what I think is seminally in, in the text and bring it to as vivid a theatrical life as I possibly can. And it's a great honor because this guy Shakespeare, it turns out, knows a thing or two about drama and uh, has a wicked theatrical imagination, unrelenting, great sense of humor, but also he is fearless about pursuing human mystery. He's fearless about it. And he is unrelenting in his portrayal of consistently mysterious events that have profound effects on our lives. And he does this by creating these fast moving dramas with multiple plots that you can't completely understand rationally. You have to bring a, a, a measure of irrational, imaginative joy, if you will, t to, your, to your viewing of, of the events in order to be able to embrace it. Be and the reason he does that is because that's just like life. It's not like he's inventing this like fantastical world that does, he's, he's inventing, creating, expressing experiences that are so seminally human that, and, that, and that they include what we don't know, which is enormous. He has the courage to, to, to express what we don't know. And so I'm just trying to find a way as a director to kind of make that as, as exciting and as, as vividly and viscerally um, apparent as possible. Uh, the Tempest is a play that I've always been kind of attracted to in some, in some way that I don't completely understand, except that I do find it to be a, a great spiritual quest play. I think the title of the play, The Tempest, is indicative of both the storm that rages at the top of the play, uh, which Prospero causes, and also the storm that's happening within him throughout the play. And I think the play, the, the first storm, which is, is, the, is the, the real storm, we see, and then for the rest of the play, we see the storm happening inside of him. And it's the, it's the calming of the waters. It's the... It's the, it's the letting go of the storm that is the story of the play. Prospero has to let go of his own storms, of his own conflicts, of his own needs, his own perceived needs for revenge, for bloodletting, for the, the tables to be turned in order for him to truly come into himself. And discover, embrace a sense of gentleness, a sense of acceptance, a sense of powerlessness, which is probably the greatest power that he can try to embrace. I think Prospero historically, I, I don't want to sound like I, <laughs> I'm going to be representing all of the Prosperos throughout history. I mean, his, this production has been done a zillion times by great artists and everybody has their own take on it. And um, but one thing that I have latched onto myself personally is I think Prospero is extremely active. I don't see him as a kind of um, receding academic. There's obviously a, 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 a narrative that says he's lost in his books, he's lost in his alchemical machinations, and you know, um, and clearly the man is obsessive about knowledge. And he's obsessive about, about knowledge um, because it gives him power. I mean, he has extraordinary powers that he exercises in the world. He causes a storm. <laughs> the first thing we see is this guy, yeah, let's make a storm happen and these guys will drown. I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff. And it's a little bit superhuman, you know, but the, but the, the, the journey for me is about his assessment that, that all that power he's able to acquire in those ways 
um, is not is not the real power that he's having to try to gain some 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 knowledge of in the course of the play, which is which is the power of letting go, the power of succumbing. I mean, and yes, he does go back to Milan. He says, give me my robes, right? Give, give me my robes. I'm going to go back to Milan and I'm going to become my, I'm going to take back my dukedom, right? But m- for me, that represents, I'm going to now go from being isolated my whole life to joining a community, to taking the responsibility of being a different kind of leader, a different kind of responsible, conscious Malleable, vulnerable, open human being. That's different, you know, than I'm going to go back and ride on my chariot and get my secretary to you know, ride, do all my stuff. It's not that. I think he's, he's becoming, for me, he becomes a leader like Lao Tzu. You know, he, he starts to, I mean, if you want to take this out into fairyland, you know, he picks up the Tao, you know, and says, okay. How do I really do this in a way that uh, that's conscious with forgiveness as my as my companion, as my guide, as my aid towards informing my actions? That's a different way to go.